Hello, everyone. For those of you just joining us, welcome to the Radical Exchange Annual Conference. Our next session will be Colonized by Data, the Cost of Connection. I'll turn it over to you, Sonal, for an introduction of you and the panelists and let you begin your session. Thank you so much. And thank you to everyone that's joined this uh, conversation. It's such an important conversation. My name is Sonal Shah. I am a professor at Georgetown University. I run a center called the Beck Center for Social Impact and Innovation. And it is my profound pleasure to be uh, moderating this conversation, Colonized by Data, the Cost of Connection. There is no probably more important time to be having this conversation than now, given what's going on in the world from a social perspective, from a health perspective, from an economic perspective and a political perspective. This is such a critical conversation. So I wanna introduce our two uh, presenters, speakers, uh, and let them take it over to uh, sort of give us a presentation. And hopefully all of you will ask questions because this is an even more interesting conversation when you ask questions and uh, when you push the conversation. So it's important for me and for us. So first, let me start with introducing Nick Caldry, who's, the, uh, who's a professor at the London School of Economics and professor of media communications and social theory at the London School of Economics. He's written extensively on data capitalism, uh, looking at why data matters, making data livable, how we might regulate data. Uh, he's just an expert in this and it's gonna be uh, it's gonna be very important. He's also most recently, I believe, come back from a sabbatical. So he's had experience both also in the private sector side where he's worked, uh, where he was at Microsoft, I believe, right, Nick? And, and so he brings also not just an academic perspective, but also a real-time perspective in having participated in that. Uh, our second professor is Ulysses Mejias. Uh, he's assistant professor of communication studies and director of the Institute of Global Engagement at the State University of New York College at Oswego. And uh, he's on the board of directors of humanities, of, of director of humanities of New York, and also has done tr uh, tremendous research on uh, in critical internet studies, network theory and science, philosophy of technology, sociology and communications, and political economy of digital media. Uh, so excited that you are both here, so excited you have written this book, and would like to just turn it over to you, Nick and Ulysses, to keep moving, uh, to give us our presentation, and look forward to the conversation. Thank you very much, Sonal, and hello, everyone. It's great to be part of Radical Exchange this year. What Ulysses and I want to do is to give you an overview of the argument of our recent book, The Costs of Connection. The question we try to address in this book is basically very simple. What is going on with data? How should we frame the countless new and not so new things and developments with data in business, in government, in society, and in our personal lives? Now, there are many ideas on the table, and most of them focus around saying it's all about capitalism, possibly a new stage of capitalism, a digital capitalism, informational capitalism, platform capitalism, most famously Shoshana Zuboff's idea of surveillance capitalism, or perhaps just simply data capitalism. But in our book, we ask something different. We want to ask whether what's going on is something potentially even larger, something truly momentous in world history. That is a new phase in the relations between colonialism and capitalism, what we might call data colonialism. And before we get to our definition of data colonialism, we want to give you a little background. So in this book, we understand capitalism as a very large scale economic system that reproduces itself through social relations. And we'll come back a little later to how we use Marx, who was, of course, the greatest social theorist of capitalism. For a moment, let's just think about Polanyi, who argued that capitalism established itself in the 19th century as a social transformation based on commodification of certain key assets in the economy, labor, land, and money. But this was only possible on the basis of a complete reorganization of the world's resources that happened two or three centuries earlier. In other words, the resource appropriation of historic colonialism. Now today we're being told the data is the new oil from that famous cover of The Economist a few years back. Oil is the typical colonial asset. Is this phrase just a metaphor or is it perhaps a sign of a new commodification based on a fundamental new type of resource, 
that is being appropriated today to start off a new colonialism, the extraction of data from human life. Well, that's exactly what we're proposing. So a uh, central point in our argument is basically that this is not a metaphor. We're using the word colonialism very carefully and certainly not metaphorically. We are in fact trying to describe an emerging reality. So we're essentially talking about a new phase in the relations between colonialism and capitalism that as Nick said, we're calling data colonialism. And this emerging phase is basically preparing the ground for a new mode of capitalist production, just like colonialism prepared the ground for industrial capitalism. We can think about plantations, for instance, financing the factories. So data colonialism is coexisting with the inequalities created during colonialism. The legacy of underdevelopment, of racism and violence continues to be with us and shapes this new emerging form of colonialism. So it is deeply continuous with the goals of historic colonialism. Now, are we suggesting, therefore, that we uh, can expect to see the same level of physical violence that we think of when we think of colonialism? We're not. We're not making a one-to-one -one comparison, but we are saying that the impact, the social change is comparable. So we're talking perhaps about different means, but sim similar ends. So let me give you sort of our official definition of what data colonialism is. We're saying that it is an emerging order for the appropriation of human life so that data can be continuously extracted from it for profit. And in order to understand this definition, we also need to understand the difference between colonialism and coloniality, which is a term developed by a uh, Peruvian sociologist, Aníbal Quijano. And his point was that, yes, there are basically no more colonies, depending on who you ask, but the legacy of colonialism continues to shape lots of things, including power relations, race relations, even the construction of knowledge. So we are saying that there are differences between historic colonialism and data colonialism. There are differences in terms of the modes the intensities, the scales, the context. But we are saying also that there is one clear similarity and that is the historical function of colonialism. That is the same. And that function is to dispossess. The old colonialism grabbed land. The new one basically grabs us, our social lives through the medium of data. So how is this being justified? The reason this new emerging order is effective is that it is based on new rationalities that have deep roots with colonial rationalities. Whether we're talking about economic or legal or technological rationalities, they have a deep colonial past. Let's start with cheap nature. To colonize the world, Nature had to be framed as cheap. It was supposed to be abundant. It was supposed to be free. From a legal perspective, it had to be framed as land without an owner, at least a civilized owner, which is where the concept of terra nullius, a Latin term that basically means no man's land, was applied to appropriate different lands throughout the world. The next step was cheap labor. Some humans, which in colonialism was mostly determined by race, were supposed to provide the labor required to transform nature into wealth. So exploitation and abuse were thus framed as social progress. This was all supposed to be for the betterment of humanity. Now, of course, we have not just cheap nature and cheap labor, but cheap data. And cheap data share some of the same extractive rationalities that we just um, discussed with nature and labor. It is also supposed to be abundant and it is supposed to have no owner in its aggregate form, at least, of course, we produce it individually, but uh, in its aggregate form, it's supposed to have no owner. It needs processing, right? 
So companies with the appropriate technology are supposed to be the only ones who can process this resource. Our only job then is to generate it. And we're told that this is what progress looks like. But what do we gain by looking at things this way? Yes, yeah, so we recognize that it's uncomfortable. It's unsettling to compare what's going on with data in the global north and the global south to colonialism. So what are the advantages of this approach? The first advantage is that it changes the time scale on which we think. A colonial approach means understanding what's going on today with data in terms of not just the past 40 years of the internet and social media platforms, but the past 500 years. And it also means looking further ahead into the future, seeing not, what, not just what's happening in the next five years or so, but potentially over the next decades. After all, the historical colonialism only led to capitalism after a delay of around two centuries. It may be more accelerated this time, but that's certainly the time scale on which we should be thinking. So we're thinking about what's going on with data as a new mode of resource extraction, just as world well changing as the conquest of the Americas around five centuries ago that is laying the foundations for capitalism's next stage, possibly some decades into the future. The second advantage of a colonial framework is that it widens the scope of what we look at, the range of our analysis. What's happening with data is not just a rogue variant of capitalism. It's a fundamental transformation of capitalism as a whole. So of course it affects social media platforms, but it's also just as present in the extension of surveillance into more and more forms of everyday work, particularly those less paid forms of work, it's about the extension, the emergence of the gig economy. It's about the growth of logistics, which has been going on for 30, 40 years across every area of business, but of course always involves the extraction of data, which in turn involves the ever more close monitoring of actual workers and bodies. And finally, and most neglected of all, data colonialism is about the growth and the management of internal corporate data. IBM, not normally seen as a poster boy for a big tech or anything these days, said in its annual report in 2017 that 80% of the world's most valuable data is internal corporate data. Now, what counts as internal data for a corporation is actually changing. It's expanding as more and more of our devices in everyday life depend on extracting data from the flow of our everyday life. That's the internet of things. And then there are two other advantages of this colonial approach, which are change the depth of which we understand what is going on in, with data. These are not superficial changes. What we're talking about here, just as with colonialism itself, is not a few isolated acts of extraction, but a new social order, emerging forms of dependency and rule of governance, which of course, will reinforce older inequalities of class, gender, and above all, race. And then finally, the final advantage of the colonial approach is to help us see what we would otherwise miss, which is the biggest continuity of all with the original historical colonial frame. The continuation and all the rhetoric around big data, the rhetoric around tech for public health, and so many other areas, the continuation of the West's long-term attempt to impose one single version of rationality on the world. All of that is a continuation of the entanglement of power and knowledge and rationality throughout modernity, which of course lies at the core of the very idea of coloniality that Ulysses mentioned a while back. Now to understand what's going on with data, we do also need to draw creatively on Marx's theory of how capitalism is reproduced. For Marx, as you no doubt know, labor relations were the engine of capitalism's social reproduction. And that's still very, very important because labor is increasingly being datafied. But now that is not enough to understand what's going on with data. This emerging new social order has to be understood both in terms of labor relations and in terms of a new type of social relation, which we call data relations. That is the reconfiguring of social life precisely so the data can be extracted from it for profit. 
And by the way, we're drawing here on a great Marxist thinker, Moshe Postone, and his reading of Marx's theory of capitalism as fundamentally about not labor relations or even commodification, but about abstraction, abstracting from life the possibilities of commodification. Through this, ordinary social life becomes a direct input to capitalist production. Marx talked about this in terms of seed and manure when agriculture becomes capitalized, becoming direct inputs to production. We're saying that it's no longer just seeds or manure, it is the stuff of human life through the continuous monitoring of our lives and the attempt to influence it. And we know on a daily basis how this happens. We're part of it. Every time we accept the terms and services of an app or a platform or a smart device, we fall back into the spiral of data relations. And usually we do it quite peacefully. And that leads to a crucial point as well, that historic colonialism was extraction based on absolutely no pre-existing social relations whatsoever. So there were only two choices to seize the gold, physical violence and deception. But data colonialism can build on two centuries of capitalist social relations. So there is no physical violence necessary for this. Just to tweak in the background legal terms of what we do on our phones is enough to change our relations to the flow of our personal lives in a fundamental way. So let's talk more specifically about this coloniality of data relations that we're mentioning. And in the book, we conduct various transhistorical comparisons, basically using the past to try to understand the coloniality of data relations in the present. And we organize these comparisons using the same 4X game plan found in strategy video games, which is explore, expand, exploit, and exterminate. So if you played a strategy video game, like the one that's shown in the background here, uh, volume of this uh, civilization series. This one actually is titled Colonization. And in the game, you can play the, uh, the British, the Spanish, the Dutch, or the French. And your goal is basically to apply these four steps again and again. The natives and the lands are basically controlled by the computer. So they have little agency. And uh, your objective is just to colonize the territory. So we don't have time to do uh, an analysis of each one of uh, these, but let's just focal, focus on a couple of them. Let's start with Explore. And here I want to compare two historical documents. The first one that you see is from Google's Terms of Service for their browser Chrome. And in case, like most of us, you haven't read it, uh, here's what it says in part. When you install Chrome, quote, you give Google a perpetual, irrevocable, worldwide, royalty-free, and non-exclusive license to reproduce, adapt, modify, translate, publish, publicly perform, publicly display, and distribute any content which you submit, post, or display on or through the services. That's a lot of text. I want to compare this uh, uh, text with another one called the Requerimiento which in Spanish translates to something like the demand or the requirement. This was a document that was read by Spanish conquistadors as they conquered uh, villages and cities in the new world. They would arrive sometimes in the middle of the night unseen. They would stand outside the village and proceed to read this document in Spanish to an audience that didn't speak Spanish. And the document said in part, I will read, but if you do not submit, I certify to you that with the help of God, we shall powerfully enter into your country and shall make war against you in all ways and manners that we can and shall subject you to the yoke and obedience of the church and of their highnesses. We shall take you and your wives and your children and shall make slaves of them and as such shall sell and dispose of them as their highnesses may command. And we shall take away your goods and shall do all the mischief and damage that we can. The Spanish Requerimiento 1513, click and accept there to install. So yes, we're not saying that what happened after the Requerimiento was read is the same thing that happens after we install um, Chrome. Uh, 
but we are calling attention to the use of this misleading and abstract language to conduct this trick of dispossession where we give away some of our rights and some of our data. Now, what about exploitation? So we are trying to read what's going on with data as a very, very general change in human beings' relations to the, the stuff of their lives, if you like, what we call in the book, the space of the self. But another key point is that how this will be implemented, this apparently very general change will be extremely unequal. Data extraction, the management of data, the management of people through data are becoming already major new tools of social governance which are transforming what we think of as how we know the social world. And there are many important studies, particularly in the US of how this is happening in the credit sector and so on, social services based around the exploitation of class and race. But all of that exploitation is also at the same time happening within a much more general change, which is the invasion of every one's subjective life represented by data colonialism, a general condition that we also need to understand at the same time because it gives the force to these particular forms of exploitation. So we will try to wrap up by offering some thoughts uh, that we have on how to decolonize data, how to resist uh, what we're seeing. And we have to start by realizing that we're talking about a multifaceted problem which amalgates 500 years of injustices. So one track approaches are not going to work. Yes, we have to care about regulation and put pressure on governments to do that. We can individually opt out of certain platforms and engage in some sort of boutique form of activism, but this is not going to be enough. We have to realize that. We also have to reject this universal rationality of data extraction and collection and to preserve, in order to preserve spaces that are not open to commodification. And that's why we think that the data dignity proposal that Jaron and Glenn are putting forth, while very bold and detailed, it doesn't go far enough to the extent that it doesn't question the underlying premise that some social experiences should not be datafied in particular ways. We also have to learn to protect the space of the self from external tracking and interference, even if we're promised this uh, co-ownership of our data, or even if we are paid for our data, which is more broadly why we are suggesting that we have to decolonize data by reclaiming space and time. The space colonized by surveillance cameras, by digital assistants in our kitchens, in our bedrooms, the time colonized by screens. And lastly, we're suggesting that we have to learn from the colonial struggles. Some people basically have centuries of experience standing up to colonialism, and we need to learn from those experiences. We can learn how these struggles have reappropriated technology, how they re have conceptualized common knowledge and built new forms of solidarity all by using a very important weapon against colonialism, and that is imagination. So to end, decolonizing data is primarily, we're saying, an exercise in creativity, in collectively imagining what this connection looks like and what new forms of connection might look like. And we're very interested to hear what Sonal has to say about that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ulysses and uh, Nick, this is so uh, helpful. And I hope everybody is sending in questions, looking forward to your questions. I see Samantha's putting them in. Uh, in the meantime, what I thought I would start with, you know, when I listen to you and after I've read, uh, I've read the uh, book, there's, I, I sort of have, I feel like I'm, I play both sides. I'm like, I see where it can be helpful, but I see what the challenges are that you're facing. And 
Um, one, just even as you were going through your presentation, it's sort of honestly depressing <laughs> to hear how how far we've come as a society and how far, and, and then you read that doc, you read that about the Spanish colonialists and it was just like, oh, we're still there. Um, so one part is like, what about human nature? Let me just start with this. What about human nature? Is it that we keep repeating a, a colonial mindset? that we are, we are so free willing to give up our data for convenience or for something that might come. What, are, what is it that you feel and from the research and you've done, and both of you are in communication. So I'd be super interested uh, on that perspective. Um, which we should start. There's a lot to say, Ulysses. Go ahead, Astro Nick. Um, okay, well, one thing it's worth saying is that when historic colonialism started, um, we forget this now because we take for granted all those structures. There was an enormous debate about what human nature was. The Spanish court had to struggle with its conscience. How is it possible to take the gold from people who might become Christians? And they took 50 years to work out that maybe they were subhuman after all, and it was broadly okay. And there was a lot of philosophical debate about that. Our, our definition, our racialized definition of human nature emerged precisely to legitimize colonialism. So there isn't a general notion of human nature, I think, but insofar as there are continuities, there are continuities of power as we see them. Um, this may be an unexpected continuity. No one expected what's happening now with data. And a great illustration of that is if you look at uh, one of the great celebrators of colonialism, the historic form, Carl Schmitt, the Nazi political theorist, he wrote in his book, The Nomus of the Earth in 1950, when Nazism had failed and he thought the whole international uh, legal order was crumbling, he said, we can't get it back again. We could do it 500 years ago when we suddenly discovered the planet was there for the taking, but that can't happen again unless we discover a new planet. What he didn't realize that there is a new planet, the planet of human life itself, seen from the point of view of extraction, seen in a radically new light and therefore it's, not, it's the same in a deep, deep way, but it's also radically new. And hence, as and here we agree with Charlotte Zuboff, it's so shockingly new, we find it hard to grasp it. And hence, it's not hard to be tricked into this new world of extraction. Yeah, I guess I would just add uh, that uh, we do acknowledge that this is, uh, it can send us a very pessimistic, hopeless message. And I always mention that maybe as someone from the global south, I'm a little bit more comfortable with uh, pessimism, but I, I do think we need to be realistic. I think we can't afford to um, sugarcoat these problems and we need to address them directly. And like you said, Sonal, I think a, lot, a large part of why this continuation is so pervasive is that it's always based on a lot of change and confusion. And I think what's interesting about reading out loud that uh, requerimiento is that you realize how significantly colonizers were able to shift the terms of discourse, you know, uh, uh, most obviously by, you know, presenting a language that the other party couldn't even understand. But that language was also the language of private property. And that language was also the language of certain types of rights and who would count as a subject or not. So I think colonial expansion always happens in this uh, uh, arena of confusion. And I think we're certainly living through one. Uh, at the same time, there are those continuities that we can pinpoint. And I think that should give us hope that uh, uh, certainly it shouldn't take us 200 years to realize what's going on this time. And we can pinpoint those problems much more quickly. And I'm gonna ask one more question as I see there's lots of questions coming in, but one more question to both of you. I mean, on one hand, there's there's sort of the capitalization of, of data and, and turning it into sort of business processes and selling selling you goods, items, all of these other things. On the other side, um, you know, I've worked in two governments and uh, government also looks at data to, at least when I was there, and that doesn't mean that every government's doing the same thing, but how do we make sure we get access to services to the communities that need it? How do we make sure that we sort of have an understanding of what the, what, whether it's something like the census, that we have an understanding of, of where people are, where are the communities, where do we need to, you know, what should we be looking at as a, as a society? How do you think about it from a public good perspective um, outside of the sort of the capital, capitalism perspective? 
you want to go start on this one, Ulysses, or? I can't, ah, we can't hear you. <laughs> we you lost start. Ulysses. I, I'll start. Well, there's a chapter in the book that deals exactly with this, which is chapter four, because as we said in this presentation, we, we're arguing the whole definition of social knowledge is changing. And it changed also when industrial capitalism got going, um, when we saw the rise exactly of the census, statistics, and so on. Um, and there's a fundamental difference today, which is although we're talking about knowledge of our shared world, it's fundamentally privately owned now. Around about the 1980s, there was a big shift in the United States, which is where information about society started to be more gathered and collected and controlled by private corporations than by states. So we reach the situation now where the state is fundamentally dependent on corporations for vast elements of its data, which transforms state corporation relations in a fundamental way. Now, we're not saying for a moment that data is bad. <laughs> there are many things we want to know about our society. We want social control over that. What's potentially bad is corporate control over data and over the flows of data, which as it were, rule out, muscle out, any sense of a public debate about this stuff, which is the stuff of our social life as well as our individual lives. So it's really important that governments react to this and get involved. However, not on the terms of corporations, which means they have to renegotiate their terms. And governments, even in the United States, the most powerful, one of the most powerful governments in the world are in very weak position right now. And I would just add that uh, uh, this is another area where hopefully we can learn from history because colonialism was always a partnership between states and corporations and they needed each other. And corporations can't do everything by themselves. They need the legal uh, moral support of the government and it used to be of the church as well. So I think, uh, again, this is where we can sort of uh, try to learn some lessons about that delicate balance and how we can put pressure on both parties because uh, uh, we do need to approach, uh, look at it from both sides, um, states as well as corporations. Yeah, it's a great point. And, and the partnership is a, is a great point. I, I, I'm going to read you some questions. We have about 20 minutes re remaining. Um, one just uh, sort of factoid from when I was in government is uh, every time the government wanted to collect data, uh, the, the, the fear of the government having it seemed to be much greater than the fear of the private sector having it. So this was a consistent battle when I was there. People didn't want to give it to the government, but they were willing to give it to Amazon or Google or anyone else uh, with, with more trust. And it's sort of just an interesting question. But let me get to a question here from Mai, who says, um, how did colonialism impact and the, how does colonialism impact the most affected by the digital divide? How does data colonialism um, impact the most? Uh, I think that's what she's asking. How do you how do colonial impact the most affected by the digital divide? How does it affect yeah. those that don't have it, that don't have access to the services? Well, for sure, I think that that's uh, an interesting issue. Although sometimes the reverse is actually a, a more problematic um, issue, which is that colonialism and capitalism function by including by inclusion, not by exclusion so much. Yes, so there are parts of the world and populations that are excluded. And so we're used to thinking about, you know, modernity as we have to help those who are excluded, bring them on board. And so they can partake of the benefits of technology, which is a very colonial way of looking at it. But uh, um, by and large, I think the problem is the terms in which we enter modernity. Yeah. Uh, which in colonialism, um, you know, meant that uh, populations had to adopt a certain rationality, a certain view of the world. And so we are continuing to see that with data colonialism, where as you just mentioned, you know, the idea that uh, it's okay to give my data to a corporation because I trust them uh, is kind of, uh, has been ingrained in our DNA. So we have to sort of challenge that and question that. And just one small writer to that. Um, the digital divide in a sense is being partly transformed. Of course, there are parts of the world where smartphones are not accessible, where internet connection is not adequate. But if you look at poverty in the United States, for example, as Julia Tacona has brought down, uh, 
Chicago has brought out in a great work on people doing uh, domestic service, cleaning and so on, looking after babies in the United States, they have no choice but to have a smartphone. Mm -hmm. And they have to have it because they have to get the app, which gives them the next job. Because if they miss that job, they lose their money and they lose their uh, livelihood. They have no choice and therefore they absolutely have no ability to negotiate the terms of connection. That's yeah. becoming the new form of digital divide. Can you ne renegotiate the terms of connection? And you can write that large on a global scale as well. If you look at African countries and their ability or not to renegotiate what Facebook or Google happens to be offering them. Yeah, so the next question actually follows, Nick, exactly around those same lines. How can we give up the use of Google and other internet services that have become a human right? And how can we combat such practices without boycotting essential services? Or for many, as you were mentioning, whether it's the app to find the job, how do you, if you can't access your job, you know, how do you fight back? Um, mm. That is the trick, trick question. And that's why, you know, when we were talking about one track approaches, just giving up certain services is not going to be enough. And I myself, for instance, I'm not on Facebook and I feel very sanctimonious about it, but I have to use Google. Because even my school, now all of our IT services are uh, outsourced to Google and I use Amazon. So um, we can think of boycotting or leaving certain platforms. And I think we should uh, do that to the extent that it's possible. At the same time, we should also acknowledge that, for instance, activists rely on those tools. And it's a very important uh, part of uh, what they do. So Twitter is very important, uh, uh, Facebook. Although even in our book, we talk a little bit about uh, activists who have used those tools and then basically wondered if it was worth it uh, because they were um, contesting or challenging, trying to challenge capitalism. And then you realize, you know, you also just made those people richer by using their products, even though you're using them for the right cost. So there's no easy answer. And I think each uh, individual, each community will have to confront those issues by themselves. Yeah, uh, great point. We have about 12 more minutes. So I'll give you a few more questions here. Uh, how do we balance the commodification of data as labor with the decommodification needed to end extractive data practice? Well, obviously we know that some people are arguing and we obviously Glenn and uh, Jaron have argued this, that some form of commodification data is potentially a good thing. It could be rescued. It could give money to people who don't have much money. Um, it could recognize in a social way what the actual labor people do and so on. And we don't uh, dismiss that argument in any sense. It's a serious attempt to deal with some of the injustices that are involved. The way we see it, though, it's just a small part of the much bigger datafication of social life, a lot of which is far beyond the what counts as our human labor. So it can at best only be yet another partial solution. Um, in thinking about decommodification, that is the fundamental point that is so often missed. Um, because yes, we might want to be paid for our time on Google and so on. We might want countries to own their national data, to have control of it, wrest it from corporations. That might be worth it. But there's also the fundamental question of whether it's even humanly acceptable for employers to see they have the right to constantly track their employees. For example, look at the Amazon warehouse floor. It's just basic management now that you track a worker wherever they are, wherever, whenever they lift their finger. This, I think, is an intolerable breach in the basic conditions of human labor and its dignity. But we accept it because we've accepted the rationality of commodified data extraction. We have to challenge that. And we don't do that often enough because we just take on this idea that, well, maybe data could be mod commodified. Maybe we could be paid for it. It's a much broader problem of extraction that we have, can only start from by challenging that logic of commodification and, as Postoni put it, abstraction. Yeah, the first you know, it's interesting, uh, Nick, as you're saying that is how many labor unions are thinking about how they're being, how their labor is being tracked. And yeah. it's certainly not a conversation I have heard in labor negotiations. So it's fascinating that, you know, on one hand, we're having a data conversation and then there's a labor conversation and you in just one sentence put it all into one conversation. It's about human dignity. Fundamentally. Yeah. 
Yeah. And that um, goes a lot deeper than the, the workings of this or that market. Yeah, 100%. Um, how do you concretely protect the self and prevent information from being commoditized? Does this only depend on privacy? I know you all offered some suggestions yeah. at the end. I would love, I'd love maybe a bit more. I think as you, as you said earlier, and he'll, he'll, I'm sure they come in here, we are cautious about what, whether there's any one track solution to this. There are limits to the word privacy for the simple reason that it seems to be not nimble enough term to catch the fundamental ways in which our lives are now just open to extraction. So on so many dimensions, we don't even get the moment to consent and think about it. It's just being taken. Julie Cohen, the legal theorist, makes uh, that sort of point. On the other hand, we can't throw away the tool of privacy because it's one everyone un understands. So we need to keep it on the table. But it is this much more fundamental reimagination of our relations to technology that we need to think about. And that's what we're trying to open up by talking about imagination, as Ulysses did. Yeah, and I would add that um, I think, yes, in our view, this is uh, this goes beyond just privacy and surveillance. I think we need to extend our uh, understanding of some of these uh, issues. And uh, for instance, uh, one way to do that is to look at the work of Franz Fanon. And he basically came up with a theory of how colonialism creates certain neuroses on the colonial subject. So he tried to catalog this psychopathology of uh, colonialism, how it was impacting the uh, colonial individuals, colonized individuals. And I think we need to start cataloging uh, the psychopathology of data colonialism, because it's not just about privacy and the fear of always being monitored. It's also about all the problems of addiction that by now there's plenty of research that shows how you know, use of these platforms can cause addiction. It's about the exposure to harassment and bullying that uh, uh, women suffer online and minorities. Um, it's about uh, loss of memory of certain kinds of memory. So uh, in our view, this goes much more beyond just a privacy and surveillance. Um, so along those lines, Elise, a, a, a comment and a question, not, not a question, but a statement then asking for a comment that says, unspoken is that we are willing to trade our data because we like we feel like an infinite resource. As long as we think, react, comment, we generate new data. Uh, can you comment on that? Well, infinite resource. It's true that we imagine that and we're not against data, as, we, as I stressed earlier. This book is not a book against the collection of data. We can certainly imagine a community coming together, say a street, saying we need to understand any violence happening on our street, quality of our air, and so on. Let's take control of that data flow. Let's change the quality of our lives by getting that data, just as we do when we write a diary about our life, and so on. There's nothing wrong with the collection of data. Everything is about the terms on what it's done. But mm -hmm. sadly, that is not the way data is being collected today. If you even take the COVID-19 crisis, where for sure there's no one who doesn't want data about the spread of the disease, it's a fundamental human need right now, how it's being done, we're defaulting to apps again. Right. Apps which require us to have smartphones, which may or may not have, require us to have an app put onto the smartphone with Bluetooth switched on, which exposes us to marketers' messages, which come at us every time we enter the supermarket, if we have Bluetooth switched on. Because we're defaulting to a certain type of big tech solution to solve fundamentally social problems, we are already buying in to this colonial uh, occupation, if you like, that we're talking about at the level of human life. And it's that that we've really got to challenge. And it's a big challenge of the imagination, for sure. And that's why I think uh, we used the image at the beginning of the presentation about the data is a new oil, because I think it shows how we tend to think about uh, data as this kind of a, a raw resource that's just abundant and free and just there for the taking. Uh, but if we, so if we trace a progression of how we define first nature as something that is cheap, which by the way is uh, Jason Moore's argument, and then we look at how labor was framed the same way, and then how data today is being framed that way. Yes, it's just inexhaustible. It is some form of exhaust. I produce data, but it has no value to me individually on 
until a corporation comes along and turns it into a valuable resource. So uh, again, this is part of the narrative that I think uh, we find that it's already ingrained in our imagination and which we have to basically work hard to decolonize that imagination. Uh, one uh, question we have about uh, just like five minutes here. Do you worry that resisting commodification of things uh, hides and perpetuates exploitation at times, uh, for example, domestic work? Can you repeat that again, please? Do you, in other words, do you worry that resisting commodification of things hides and perpetuates expo exploitation at times, for example, uh, domestic work? And look, I'm not quite sure. It's yeah, not I'm not quite sure what the uh, yeah, I'm not quite sure what the question is, but let me try to rephrase it and see yeah. if this might help. So yeah. maybe the, maybe part of it is um, if you don't if you resist the, the commodification, getting access to things like domestic work is harder because now oh, yeah. it's commodification and but but it further uh, perpetuates exploitation. Well, for sure, if you want to take the political act that we're maybe advising in the book, although we're very cautious about not giving advice to anyone in particular. Yeah. To say, uh, don't come on, I'm not gonna take this app, I'm gonna stand, then you are very, very vulnerable in today's markets. And with COVID-19, you may not be able to travel and so on and so forth. So this is a very difficult negotiation. Um, but of course, that is part of the exploitation that's going on at the largest scale. So we wouldn't say that resisting it uh, hides exploitation, it uncovers a deeper level of exploitation, which is our binding in to the whole deal. That's where the deepest exploitation lies. Unless we get that into view, we can't help build a collective strategy of resistance, uh, which is where the solidarity comes in. This can only be a collective struggle if it's anything at all. And I would take uh, another approach to, to that question and say that we also have to remember that capitalism works not just by commodifying things, but by leaving some things uncommodified. And actually that's where the real benefit happens. So yes, labor was commodified and uh, goods were commodified, but uh, uh, capitalism also needed workers and in order for the worker to get up in the morning and go to work, you need a lot of labor that happens in terms of cooking breakfast and making sure the house is clean and children are off to school. And all of that labor is uncommodified. It's right. not part of that value chain. So uh, that exploitation in some ways continues to happen and capitalism benefits by leaving those areas uncommodified, which is what Nick was talking about when uh, on the slide about data relations. Uh, about abstraction. What really matters is abstraction. So um, we do have to keep that in mind that um, especially when it comes to our social lives, I think that's how the system is very efficient at commodifying something that we don't, that's not work, that's not a material good. This is, we're talking about our social lives, our interactions with our families and with our friends. And so the way in which those have been uh, commodified, I think that's the new dimension to this uh, new uh, order that we're talking about. It's not just about, that's why we're saying it's not just a capitalist understanding of it, it's also a colonial understanding because it's just more about than uh, labor and material goods. Yeah. So we've got about two minutes. I'm gonna ask you both a final question uh, and, and one is um, just sort of as you as as you know the audience sort of list has listened to this conversation and and to your presentation. What are the what is one thing from each of you that you want people to take away from this conversation, or uh, one or two things? Let me just put it that way. But if you could do that quickly, it would be great because I think uh, we want to leave people with a thought as they leave here. Um, shall I go first? Um... I think one thing I want to say, and I think this is very much common ground with the whole philosophy underlying radical exchange and Glenn's work and so on, is that we too in this book are interested in reimagining the economy, reimagining society, our relations to these fundamental uh, processes of production. Um, but where we differ um, so far from the debate that's been within radical exchange is that we can't do it by 
expanding cotton modification or commodifying in a different way. We need to challenge the fundamental drivers of commodification and what's pushing them in terms of the occupation of territory, if you like, the territory of the human life. That's the fundamental thing we challenge, which is taken for granted in many of the, on the face of it, radical proposals offered for the new economy. There's common ground in the imagination, but we have to make one step further back to the fundamentals to get a real debate. Well, and I would just quickly say that, yes, that point about imagination, I think it's very important. And when I look at the history of the resistance to colonialism, uh, what inspires me is always also the cultural response to it. That colonialism is not just something that you fight with your bodies, but with your minds, through art, through culture, and through new forms of, uh, of conviviality. So to me, that's very important. Well, I want to thank you both for this uh, amazing conversation and for pushing our thinking, because I think uh, too often we're very comfortable with where we are and just wanting for it to be slightly more efficient. But I think what you're pushing us to do is to think outside of that and think about what kind of life we want to lead and what kind of dignity we want to lead it with. So really appreciate this conversation. And uh, and I, I hope everyone will buy this book and certainly uh, read what you have written here, if, if not anything, just to get a, just to push us to think differently. So thank you very much. And really, thank you for everything you've done. Thank you, Sano. It's been great. Thank to you talk. very much, Sano. Good talking to everyone. Take care. All the best. Bye. Bye.